Here's 10 of the biggest mistakes I've observed people make with electroculture experiments and why most content out there today is not good. If you're showing that a plant visibly got bigger before and after applying a copper coil right next to it, that is not good science if you don't have a control group. Now, what I mean by control group is it's the plant that doesn't get the treatment. So in this case, you see a cherry tomato that I put the copper coil right next to it. That's the treatment group. It's receiving the treatment, which is the copper coil, and it's what we're testing in our experiment. Whereas here in this cherry tomato, there's nothing there. So this is what's called the control group. It's not receiving a copper coil. And you must have a control group in your experiment because if you don't have a control group, how will you know that the copper coil has caused a difference? You have no standard to compare it to. There could be a million different reasons why the plants in your garden are getting bigger. As time passes, as we all know, God through nature makes plants grow. And so the copper coil does not necessarily have to be the reason why your plants are getting bigger. Many people online that have done tests with copper coils have also been saying that they don't remember having seen plants in their garden get so big before applying copper coils. But it's never a good thing to just use your memory to gauge whether a treatment, or in this case, the copper coil has made a difference. Because as you know, when you garden or farm, each year the seasons change. One season you might get a lot of rain and then the next you might get a dry spell. So it's never a good gauge to use only your memory as a baseline to compare whether the copper coil has made a difference or not. You must set up a proper control group, a plant without any copper coil in order to get to do good science. Second biggest mistake I've seen people make with electroculture experiments is that their sample size is too small. So let's assume that you have a good control group to compare with your treatment group and you go online to share your video of your electroculture experiment. If you're gonna stare at the camera and make the bold claim that this copper coil or whatever other electroculture treatment you did made a difference in the size of your plants, that's intellectually dishonest and sloppy work if your sample size is too small. You can't draw any real conclusions with that. The next biggest mistake that I see people make with electroculture experiments is that they're not properly controlling their variables. So what do we mean by that? Here I have a tray, again, with four cherry tomatoes. When you do your experiments, you have to make sure that you're starting your seeds at the same time, you're giving them the same amount of water, you're giving them the same soil mixture or plant starting mixture, and that you're using the same seed brand. There's so many different variables that you have to control for. Like You, you have to be crazy to the point where you're controlling all the variables that you can because if you don't control your variables, how will you know that it's the copper coil that made the difference and not something else. Three of these cherry tomatoes, they're in the same exact size container. I got these red containers from Costco and one of these is in this dollar store white container. You can see that the size of these four plants is different. These two tomatoes are about the same size, whereas these other two tomatoes are a slightly different size. You'd be surprised to know that for all four of these cherry tomatoes, I started them indoors at the exact same time with the exact same amount of water regimen, same seed starting mix. I tried controlling all the variables that I could and, and look at what happened. Even if you control all of your variables or most of your variables, you can still get significant variability at the time of planting. So if you're going to be planting and applying a copper coil, even if you're controlling as many variables as you can, you will never know really if it's the copper coil that made a difference or not, only because there's so many variables that you have to control. So I was exaggerating a little bit when I said that you can never know if the copper coil can make a difference or not, just because there's so many variables that you have to control. You can know if the copper coil made a difference. If you have a good control group, you have a big enough sample size, and like I said, you're crazy enough to control as many variables as possible. You have to control all the variables that you can. Now in this case, the one variable that I believe as to why these cherry tomatoes are different in size right now, despite me having controlled them previously, is that I ended up having them get stressed out unevenly. So when they were getting hardened out, they did not receive the same amount of sunlight and they were not hardened off in the same way. So that's why I believe the size difference. Another big mistake that I see people make with electroculture experiments, and this is a big one, is that their experiment cannot be replicated by another person or research group. So let's say that you did an electroculture experiment with this copper coil. You did it once, two, three, four times. You ran your experiment several times, and each time it worked for you. 
you notice that your plants got bigger, but as though that the copper coil made the difference. Now, if you describe your methods to another person or another research group, and this other group of people imitate your experiment and they try to replicate it, they try to do the exact same steps that you did, but they are not able to get the same results that you got with your copper coil, what that means is that that calls into question credibility and the validity of your experiment. Because if you did good science following the scientific method as you should, then your experiment in theory should be able to be replicated by any other person. Another big mistake that I see people make with electroculture experiments is that they don't take out their own bias from the interpretation of their results. So what do we mean by bias? Every person has a bias. We know that each person has their own unique perspectives, opinions, knowledge, wisdom. Every person is unique, so every person has a bias. Every person has their own beliefs about the world. And in this case with electroculture, everybody that does experiments is coming in with their own unique perspective, with their own bias. So when you get results and you start to interpret them, you might think that the copper coil made a visible difference. But in reality, it could be that your bias is influencing how you're interpreting your results. This is why in medicine, for example, you have double blind controlled studies because with a, with a double blind control study, neither the researchers nor the participants know who is getting the treatment. So they're, and essentially they're blinded. It's to reduce the bias of both groups so that the researchers aren't biased and the patients aren't biased. Sometimes when a person is doing research and they don't carefully remove their own bias from the interpretation of the results, what that can look like is, for example, if they're running a statistic software to analyze the significance of their results if they were expecting a specific result or they had something in mind they were favoring one result over another and they didn't carefully control their bias then that could look like them trying to fudge the numbers or trying to skew or distort how they do their statistical analysis because of their bias because they want to try to force a result that in reality wasn't so that's something that you have to be careful of if you're doing an electroculture experiment you have to control and keep your bias out of the experiment as much as possible. You have to be neutral. Another thing that you should always remember is that correlation does not equal causation. So let's say for example, you have a copper coil, you stick it next to one of your tomato plants, and then after a couple of weeks, you notice that some of your tomatoes start to get bigger compared to the tomatoes that didn't have a copper coil next to them. It's a nice correlation, it's something that you visually observe, but that does not necessarily mean that that copper coil was the cause of that effect, of that change in size of the tomatoes. We know that there can be many confounding factors, which can be other things at play. For example, you could have the texture of the soil, you could have the nutrient composition of the soil be different in one part of your bed versus the other. So in reality, it could be that those tomatoes that got bigger compared to the others just had more nutrient-rich soil compared to those that had the copper coil. It does not have to mean that the copper coil is out of play. This next point is a big one. You always have to remember that when you do an electroculture experiment or any experiment, you have to be consistent throughout the entire experiment from start to end. What do we mean by consistency? So you have to have a way to standardize your experiment throughout. So each time, for example, you're transplanting your cherry tomatoes, you have to use the same size container. You can't just have, you know, some of your containers being this red Costco container and some of them being from the dollar store. That's not a consistent experiment. It's not standardized because you know that this tomato eventually will have a bigger root ball than this one. You have to be consistent in what you do. And that leads to the next point that lab experiments that are done indoors versus ones that are done outdoors cannot be easily comparable because when you're running an experiment outside, what can happen? Tons of things can happen where you have your experiment set up, you're testing your copper coil, and then what happens halfway through your experiment, you have some random bird just swoops in and chops down half your plants, or some super hungry squirrel or rabbit comes in and just completely destroys a third of your plants. It's really hard then to compare the results of your electroculture experiments outside versus indoors, because indoors your experiments will always have better control than outdoors. Another big mistake I see people make with electroculture experiments is that they don't take precise and accurate measurements of their treatments and controls. So for the sake of this video, I won't be going through the nuance of precision versus accuracy. So let's just use precision in this case. You have to do the best job that you can to make the best measurements possible. Let's say, for example, with this cherry tomato, you're taking measurements with, with this measuring tape, you know, once every week or once every three days, you're taking measurements, right? So right now, this cherry tomato is about eight inches tall, right? From, 
from the base of the cup to the top, it's eight inches long. If you're taking measurements with a measuring tape, it's not the same precision as if you would have a way to do it digitally or if you were to have another more precise instrument to take those measurements. So that's something you always have to keep in mind is how precise are you being when you take measurements. Now the final point that I want to bring up is conflict of interest. It's a big moral ethical problem that you cannot ignore. Good, honest, trustworthy research has to be free from conflict of interest. If somebody is running experiments and they knowingly in their mind, they know that they are receiving financial incentives or they have a financial incentive or pressure to do these experiments, they have a conflict of interest that they have to declare. There is somebody that is funding them. It's the motivation behind what they're doing makes the conflict of interest. There is a fine line between conflict of interest where the motivation is not right, it's morally wrong, and it has to be reported, versus if somebody is doing research and they're receiving funding, and in many cases, a person that is doing research does receive funding from another third party or from another person. It is not bad to receive funding from somebody else to do research, but there cannot be a conflict of interest to get a certain outcome. Like there cannot be pressure from that financial incentive to try to prove a result. So in the case with electroculture with copper coils, what would the conflict of interest be? If you were to have a product, let's say the copper coil or, or an electroculture antenna or whatever other product that you're trying to sell, and you're showing that you're getting specific results with this product, when in reality it's, it's a sham, the product doesn't do anything, but you're selling it anyway, and you're telling people that it does work, that's a conflict of interest because the work that you showed, that you visibly showed that it made a difference, but yet in reality that product or that item doesn't make a difference, then that's morally wrong. That is a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is a big serious problem in research because it can affect quality of the researcher's work. Because if the researcher is doing an electroculture experiment and they have a conflict of interest at the same time, then how can they be neutral and unbiased? They have pressure from behind. Most of the times it's a financial incentive, financial pressure to get a certain outcome. And if they don't get a certain outcome, you know, bigger plants from an electroculture antenna or a copper coil, if they don't get that result, then they don't get the money. So let's say that a person is doing an electroculture experiment and they, they've done everything right that they could, right? They have a good control group. They have a good enough sample size. They've controlled all their variables. They've been consistent. They've taken precise measurements. Like they've, they've done everything in good science. A good researcher has to do. They follow the scientific method as best as they could, but they're not getting the results that they hoped for. Conflict of interest can happen in this case because even though they did everything right, they had the best of intentions, but then in the end, their science gets corrupted because if they have a conflict of interest behind to get a certain result that they, that they weren't able to do, then their final interpretation and analysis of their results can get distorted and can get corrupted. It is a great privilege and honor that God gives us that we have the tools of the scientific method and doing good science in order to discover the truths and secrets of the universe. How else would the greatest minds in history have discovered what they, what they found if, if it were not for good science? It is good, honest science that is done through the scientific method when it is done correctly. And that is when we get the most amazing results. It's the most amazing feeling in the world that when you know that you've done good science, that you know that your end result is an amazing result because it's not a feeling or an opinion. When you do good science and you discover the truth of a matter, you end up finding an objective fact. An objective fact is an amazing thing. We're, it's something that we didn't know before and now we do know. So to conclude this video, if you don't do electroculture experiments with the same rigor as, as a PhD level rigor, then you can't really claim that electroculture works. And I'm not exaggerating what I mean PhD level rigor because many people are doing experiments around the world right now and that's not bad at all. People should do experiments. People should have fun trying to experiment and see what works for them. But at the end of the day, if we're going to make big claims, if electroculture works or not, there has to be a standard. There has to be a level of rigor. You have to be extremely rigorous in what you do because if you don't take things seriously when you run these experiments and then you go online and you share your results for other people and, and you're making claims about something that you've done, 
if those claims are not true, then you're, you're basically lying. You have to be as rigorous and as honest as possible. You have to do good science in order to be taken seriously. If you make the claim that copper coils are making the difference in your electroculture experiments, and you don't acknowledge the fact that there could be so many other variables that are at play, if you don't do that, you're undermining the scientific method and you're undermining the work of other researchers because then the public in general, they don't really trust a lot of scientists today. And you, and you know the reason why many people today Especially these past few years with everything that's happened with <coughs> with that and then the sharp, you know, that thing. Many people have lost their trust and their faith in authority, in doctors, in researchers, scientists. A lot of what has happened with research has been corrupted. And now with electroculture being as popular as it is, always keep in mind that good science is needed. You know, if we are to preserve the integrity of research, of the scientific method, we can't let the reputation of science go down. In the upcoming weeks, I plan on sharing and uploading more video and content like this one in order to educate and help people understand how they can do better electroculture experiments. Because I genuinely care about good science. I want people to do good science. And I'm really excited to see just how popular electroculture has become, how so many people are interested in running their own experiments. And I feel like it's my duty as somebody with a, a science research background that I have to help people. I want to help you. And I want you to be able to run the best experiments that you can, wherever you may be. And I especially want to acknowledge one person in particular, one researcher, Yannick Van Duren. He is the top leading researcher in electroculture right now. He has some amazing video and content on YouTube, on his website. So follow Yannick Van Duren. He will teach you a lot about electroculture. So besides my channel, besides the things that I can share, I would highly recommend that you follow Yannick Van Duren. So in summary, if you're going to claim that copper coils wrapped around the wooden stick, whether that be five or 20 feet tall wood with a copper wire coil wrapped around it, you need to have a good control with that treatment to compare it with. You need to have a big enough sample size. You have to control as many variables as you can. Your, your results have to be replicated by other people. You have to take your own bias out of interpreting the results. Correlation does not equal causation. You have to be as precise and accurate as possible with your measurements. You have to be consistent throughout your experiment from beginning to end. You can't do a one-to-one -one comparison between lab and indoor experiments. And you have to avoid conflict of interest. And if there is a conflict of interest, you are morally obligated to declare that conflict of interest.